Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar entitled Ecological Connectivity Conservation, a Systems Approach to Managing and Protecting Landscapes and Seascapes. My name is Caitlin Tverge. I am the Seafood Resources Canals Fellow at the National Sea Grant Office and a member of the Lunch and Learn Committee. I would like to introduce our speaker, Mary Collins. Mary is a 2023 Canals Fellow and holds the role of Coastal Resilience Specialist for the NOAA National Sea Office, Sea Grant Office. Mary is an artist and an outdoors enthusiast. She has experience in nature-based and climate solutions coordination and consultings with or organizations such as the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Wildlife Habitat Council, and research with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Mary also holds a master's in global conservation leadership. Please welcome Mary. Hello everybody and thank you Caitlin for the great introduction and thank you to the NOAA Central Library for hosting such amazing events. Um, I'm Mary Collins and I'm excited to speak to you today about a topic I have been very close to for the past few years and that's ecological connectivity. Um, and while I'm currently the Coastal Resilience Specialist with NOAA's National Sea Grant Office, I come to you representing the IUCN WCPA Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group, uh, a group I served on the Secretariat for for the past few years. So let's get started. Today, we'll first focus on ecological connectivity and its benefits to people in nature, and then we'll dive into climate change considerations for connectivity. And then last, we will wrap everything up with looking at advancements in policy, both national and international, and how they're incorporating connectivity into their policy language. So how did I get here? Who am I to talk to you about connectivity? So it, hap it just so happens that my graduate capstone was in co-creating the first international guidelines for marine connectivity conservation. And that amounted to this document called the Rules of Thumb for MPA and MPA Networks Design. And through the strong partnerships created um, from co-writing that document, I ended up working as the International Conservation Associate for the group called the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. Now, this group is small but mighty, and they work internationally and nationally advancing uh, connectivity conservation policies and practice. And so through them, I am associated with IUCN, WCPA, and all of the wonderful specialist groups and working groups related to connectivity. So enough about that, and let's get to the meat of it. I first want to start with broadly talking about how biodiversity and social systems are inextricably linked. We rely on biodiversity for so many things and considering that over 50% of landscapes are now human dominated, it's up to us to help species and ecosystems to help us moving forward. The World Economic Forum estimates actually that over half of global GDP either moderately or highly depends on nature and its benefits, its ecosystem services for functioning. And this, what we call natural capital, is at risk due to fragmentation and other compounding factors, including climate change. And this benefit comes from ecosystem services that include carbon sequestration, coastal inundation buffers like mangroves and coral reefs, which attenuate wave uh, turbulence and flooding, and so many more ecosystem services that we um, take for granted. For example, climate regulation. Um, so it makes sense that over half of GDP depends on this. And so connectivity conservation is what can help these systems function better. So what actually is it? Connectivity conservation, connectivity 
in general is the unimpeded movement and the flow of natural processes that sustain life on Earth. And I'm going to repeat that, that sustain life on Earth. <laughs> Um, and this definition was set by the Convention on Migratory Species, CMS, in only 2020. And there's been a lot of work between now and then, which um, I will share with you in the coming slides. Ecological connectivity can broadly be bucketed into two areas, which are functional and structural. So functional connectivity encompasses the movement of species and gametes and uh, populations from one place to another, either seasonally or um, annually, whatever movements are occurring, that's functional connectivity. And I provided two examples here for you today, one being elk migrations in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and also marine migratory species corridors in the Eastern tropical Pacific. Um, and you can see in both instances that these migratory species happen to be moving in corridors. And by recognizing what these corridors are, prioritizing them and decreasing the fragmenting agents along their path, uh, we can better allow these animals to move freely and um, to access the important habitats that they need for different life cycle stages. Structural connectivity is the physical distance or connection between physical features, not animals. So this could be the connection between different habitats, different protected areas, and I've included two more examples for you here. Um, the first being Tanzania's network of protected areas in high priority corridors. Um, this is actually a national strategy uh, that Tanzania uh, completed this past year. And um, you can see all of their prioritized corridors outlined in this map. So they'll be working in the coming 10 years, 20 years to um, strongly implement conservation practices in those corridors with the communities that live there. Um, and then down at the bottom, we've got a map of the Belize Maya Mountain Corridor. This is a ridge to reef effort uh, that has been taking place. Um, and in this instance, the local communities have been highly involved in both designating protected areas that um, in, in, in water catchments that all flow into the Port Honduras Marine Reserve and uh, co-managing with government entities for um, the protection and restoration of this space. So what are some specific benefits we get from a well-connected system? Well, we've, we know already that it's essential to system function, but it also boosts resilience to disturbances. So repopulation after a disturbance happens at faster rates in a connected system. And also there's decreased severity in disturbance if a system is connected. And um, <clears throat> factors like genetic variability of individuals and plant species and ecosystems also plays a large role there. Um, promoting connectivity also tends to promote cross-border collaboration and collaboration with groups of people who might not typically be speaking with each other all the time. So socially it is, um, it, it, connectivity conservation can take down borders. So I wanted to provide also some common terms, common practices that we might all know about that incorporate connectivity conservation features. For example, ridge to reef conservation, ecosystems approaches to conservation, climate-wise conservation, biological corridors. Each of these have functional structural considerations to them. And since a lot of us joining today might be 
from Noah, I also included more marine connectivity concepts. Um, habitat connectivity uh, plays a large role in um, species repopulation and health. For example, um, if mangroves are taken out of an ecosystem, certain species might not be able to um, thrive as long because that's their nursery habitat. Um, and larval dispersal ranges can vary widely, but if we can understand the larval dispersal patterns of, for example, coral species and coral species that happen to be more resilient to climate change, then we can understand what source populations are providing climate resilient coral larvae down river, down, um, down flow. Um, it also includes considerations of shallow to deep and also migratory species. So how does climate change play a role into all of this? Um, of course, permeable landscapes, landscapes that are connected, uh, increased population variability through daily movements, gene flow, seasonal migrations, but that's all without consideration of climate change. But also connected landscapes enable rain shifts. And we all understand that that's happening both on land and at sea. And the more species are able to change their ranges without other barriers, the more resilient and adaptable they'll be able to be. So here it is a um, nature-based solution to climate change. One example of this is in the Gulf of California, Mexico, where scientists modeled from 2015 to 2025, the estimated surface temperature increases and how those conditions were suitable, future conditions could be suitable for a, the leopard grouper, and B, the leopard grouper's nursery habitat, which is sargassum. Um, and by projecting those con future conditions for both, um, scientists are able to predict where those areas will overlap in the future and be able to preemptively perhaps put protections in place or certain management mechanisms. So we've talked a lot about connectivity and its benefits, but what we need now are consistent practices and measurable targets. And a lot of this comes about through policy. So what I'm gonna do now is first, I'm gonna talk about some international policy uh, advancements in the past few years, and then I'll dive into what's going on in the US. The first, which is very exciting, uh, is the Convention on Biological Diversity's Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Uh, it's a mouthful, but <laughs> it was adopted in December 2022. Now, this frames a scale of globally aligned conservation that we haven't seen attempted ever before. Um, and it also happens to emphasize connectivity very prominently in its goals and targets. Um, specifically, goal two focuses on restoration and connectivity being a focus within restoration. Goal three is on area-based conservation measures and also management tactics for area-based protections and management. And then goal 12 is focused on human-dominated landscapes, urban landscapes, and having green spaces connected within urban landscapes. So we have a framework, but in order to track progress, we need strong indicators. 
And there have been some indicators put forward for uh, tracking progress towards the CBD and its Kudming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. I've laid out some of them for you here, but the key message here is that currently, out of the proposed indicators, we are lacking those for measuring connectivity in the ocean and on coasts. A lot of these that are poten strong potentials only relate to terrestrial environments. So that's a gap that hopefully scientists and um, those working on these issues can fill in the coming year as the um, monitoring framework for the CBD is um, established and more finalized. And if you want to hear more about recommendations that our group put together, you can access those through this report um, that was uh, submitted to the CBD during um, meetings. Another really interesting and exciting advancement is language agreed to just this March 2023 on biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions, uh, BB&J. And we also call this the High Seas Agreement. Um, and it establishes for the first time language towards a legal mechanism for protecting large portions of the globe, the largest portion of the globe, which is the high seas. You can see on this map, everything in blue is considered high seas jurisdiction. And this accounts for 64% of the Earth's surface and 95% of ocean volume. Before this, there was no unifying legal mechanism for protecting and managing this vast space. Um, and importantly, in terms of connectivity, connectivity is included as a key criteria when designating this new type of marine protected area. Um, other focus areas involved in the negotiations were area-based management tools, environmental impact assessments, which are mandatory if um, extraction or fishing activities may be harmful, largely harmful to um, those habitats and areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, marine gen shared marine genetic resources and capacity building. Other notable advancements um, is recognition by the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, in, in stating that connectivity conservation is the most consistently cited climate change adaptation measure for species. And that's a pretty strong statement coming from a pretty strong um group of organizations also the um ITBES, which focuses on ecosystem services has in july 22 adopted a proposal to undertake the first ever global assessment on ecological connectivity and this hopefully might be a great baseline for other um policy targets, goals to then measure against and for countries to measure progress against moving forward. So those are, there's many more I could talk about, but those are just some very recent highlights in the international uh, stage for what's been going on with ecological connectivity. But now I wanna highlight what's going on here at home in the US. Uh, America the beautiful, its goal is to restore, connect, and conserve 30% of U.S. lands and waters by 2030. Now, a lot of the effort so far has been on to restore and conserve, but what we need to also work on, in addition to those, is how to also connect and measure the connectedness. And so the same conversation is happening here as internationally and in other countries. The Ocean Climate Action Plan in its high level action one includes to create, connect, strengthen, and expand marine protected areas, and then enhancing the connectivity of those MPA networks as well. There's also importantly a Council on Environmental Quality, CEQ, guidance for federal departments and agencies on ecological connectivity. I highly advise each of you access this 
and especially take a look at its best practices for agencies found on page five. If you don't look at anything else, look on page five. Um, and it provides guidance for each of us working in the federal government to do what we can to, to um, advance this important area. Some upcoming policy is that um, there's a wildlife crossings pilot program in the works. It's newly established and it uses bipartisan infrastructure law funds and it will support projects to reduce the number of wildlife vehicle collisions and improve habitat connectivity um, in terrestrial and aquatic for terrestrial and aquatic species. So there'll be a call for a proposal for that coming out soon. There, there will also be an Arctic Council briefing on ecological connectivity that will be completed um, likely next year and NOAA is contributing um, information to that as well. And the audience is supposed to be a policy and management audience. I also wanna note before I move on that there's other national policies uh, that are very innovative outside of the US as well. For example, other countries are implementing national corridor policies um, and they're increasing in number. So currently we have Canada, we have Costa Rica, we have Tanzania, um, Kenya and Bhutan um, are just some but it's a very important step for countries to be able to prioritize corridors, implement them with the communities who live within them, and then track progress. So as I wrap up, I wanna share some key messages with you. Um, the world is changing due to climate change and the human imprint that um, we all bring to the table. And these fragment nature. And so nature can adopt, it's very adaptable, it does it by itself, but not within a fragmented world. So governments, companies, NGOs, they all urgently need to prioritize connecting landscapes and seascapes to facilitate adaptation for environments and species as they move. So investing in this, <clears throat> in these connections, will not only boost the natural resilience, but also help us maintain um, a lot of the services that provide financial benefits to us through local livelihoods. And also, if systems are connected, it, it actually boosts pandemic prevention and also lessens um, natural disaster impacts, among other benefits which we covered. So that's what I had to share with you today. I hope you learned something and I am happy to take any questions whatsoever. I have a document also, I think it was shared online, that has direct links to a lot of the tools and resources and policies that I mentioned today. Um, so make sure you access that and take a look at those that might be relevant for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. I appreciate your presentation. And I did just share the link with the resources you mentioned. Um, audience, we're going to take the next five minutes to answer your questions. So please type them in the questions chat box uh, in the control panel, and I'll read them to Mary. And I also want to encourage you to download Mary's slides, which she's attached as a handout, again, in the control panel. Um, so let's take a second. And oh, did we get, we got a question. Wonderful. Uh, this first question, Mary says, nice job. Nature can adapt and also transition with change drivers like natural cover loss and climate. Our restoration skills are poor, both in quality and scope. Why not turn recovery of land over to nature? She'll do it the right way. Yeah, that's a good point. Rewilding is um, gaining in popularity internationally and nature can do it by itself. But I think what comes into play in 
finding the most opportunistic places for rewilding is understanding what areas <clears throat> will have other co-benefits for species movement, for um, repopulation, for um, other, for mitigating other impacts. And so restoration is very expensive. Rewilding is a solution. Where we rewild um, can be influenced through, can, can be, can be made more uh, uh, efficient by taking into consideration connectivity planning processes and methods. Thank you for that response.